I've read your story here and there, but let's let's go back to the musical beginnings of um, from your childhood. I, I'm yeah. assuming when was it that music became something um, more than just something that you heard around the house, something that you wanted to relate to? When I was about five years old, I discovered that I knew the lyrics somehow to almost every Elvis song, mm. and it turned out I was born in 1956, which was the year of Elvis, and we had living in our house a Swedish girl who was going to, uh, I think, be freshman year in college. She was doing the transfer thing. And so she took care of me. When she babysat for me, she, being whatever she was, 18, played Elvis nonstop. And somehow I knew Hound Dog and Heartbreak Hotel, like, before I went to school. Mm. And my parents were really into big band. And they were really into comedy records. And uh, particularly comedy music, things like Flanders and Swan, Tom Lehrer, oh, yeah. that kind of uh, very clever stuff. But we're also really into, you know, Louis Armstrong and uh, uh, really uh, Cat Calloway. They loved Cat Calloway. And so I grew up in a household where people didn't play, but they really respected and listened to a lot of music. And then I'm at the bottom of a very long family line. So I have siblings who are more than 12 years older than I am. Mm -hmm. And so the result of which is they were in college when I was in elementary school. So when the dead came to uh, the Northeast in the late 60s for the first time, they of course all went. So there were Grateful Dead albums playing in my house from probably 68 on. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I'll never forget, 1969, Alice, or maybe 68, Alice's Restaurant came out, my father heard it. He thought this was the greatest thing he'd ever heard. If he saw my father, he was a very formal looking man, significantly overweight, very Irish looking. And he, when I was in elementary school, I'd come home from school, he'd come home from work, and we'd sit and listen to Alice's restaurant, feel like I'm fixing to die wreck. He loved, I mean, he just loved Country Joe. Was, and he, was he a weekend hippie? Who, my father? Yes. No, no, my father was a very old fashioned, he was born in 1916. Oh. And he worked, he was an entrepreneur in the, in the world of, of uh, finance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he started his own company, it went up, it went down, it was very volatile. No, he was, he was a Jack Daniels and you know, beer kind of guy. And, but the thing was, he was really into music, and he really encouraged his children to be into, into music. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, the first movie I ever went to was Help. And you know, so I grew up listening to music all the time, so when I got to college, I just got this chance to play in a band for the first time. And because I wasn't, in those days, I was not very adept, so it was hard for me to be kind of uh, in a band. Mm -hmm. And But in college, I just got with this group of people, and it was a magical thing. But it was one of those things where when you're 22 or so, you don't appreciate how unusual the right grouping of people is. Mm -hmm. And we had one of these bands where for a couple of years, our last two years in college, Everything was always full from like the first show we ever played. And we wrote our own stuff. We were really influenced by the dead, but also by Frank Zappa. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had a trumpet in this band and a fiddle and a, I played guitar. There was a keyboard, bass and drums. And uh, that band was called Guff. And at the end of college, one of the guys decided to go to graduate school. It's like the rest were sitting there going, we we're all really thinking we were going to take this after college. And it didn't work out. And about an hour later, I realized, you know something? You've just lost something you're never going to get back. And so I decided from that moment on, no matter what happened, I was going to keep trying to get involved in a band that was creative and doing things that mattered to somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't need to be in a big band. I just wanted to be a band that mattered to somebody. Yeah. And so, I mean, started playing happy hours doing things with my brother, but it was, you know, it took 25 years to be back in a position to play the kind of music I wanted to mm. play with the kind of people I wanted to play. Mm. When you started on guitar, who taught you? So I, there was a guy named Frank Cronson uh, in college who lived uh, on the next floor from me and our daughter lived in this tower. And Frank, um, he was crazy. I mean, he had this Fu Manchu mustache. He, he, he looked like the Harry Shearer character in, in Spinal Tap, but with a mustache that he, he cultivated a kind of Dracula look. And he, he, the fingernails on his right hand, he was a finger picker, his fingernails were, I mean, 
Cruella de Vil long. Mm-hmm. And so you, he was a really, everybody thought he was creepy because he was only a senior in college, but he was going on to do a graduate thing on fruit flies. And he was like becoming the world's expert on fruit flies. So everybody else in the dorm thought he was just too weird. But he had a double neck Gibson SG, 12 string, 6 string. And he was going to teach me to play. I mean, he really knew how to play. Wow. And uh, so that that really, that was my first time. It took me six years to graduate from college. So when I talk about the good band, that was my second time through. Mm-hmm. I had to leave because, uh, well, I went off with a girlfriend and uh, dropped out of school, and then my father died. And so I had to work for a bunch of years in order to earn enough money to get back. But when you were starting the, those guitar lessons with uh, Cruella, was it uh, classical, folk, no, no, no. rock, jazz? No, no the first song we learned, for I told, he said, what is your favorite song? I said, well, my guitar gently weeps. said, fine, mm-hmm. we're going to start with that one. What's your second favorite song? Uh, Hesitation Blues, as played by High Tuna. He goes, okay, well, we're going to work on that song. And it probably took me 15 years before I could play a passable version of either one of those things. This basic point, which was genius, which is, listen, don't learn something you hate. You won't keep with it. Mm-hmm. Learn stuff you like from the beginning. Even if you're no good at it, it's in your, you know, if it's in your soul, it'll come into your playing eventually. Yeah. And, you know, that was the coolest thing because I like music that, you know, I like, I like music that swings. I like, you know, the, uh, I like shuffles. I like, you know, I just, I grew up listening to big band stuff mm-hmm. and then the Beatles. Yeah. Did you add bass or pretty early on? To no, no, that's a totally a Moon Alice thing. Oh, and that was, no, it was funny. I <laughs> never picked up a bass until we started Moon Alice. Wow. And we developed this whole shtick at the look. Moon Alice started was I was a project with Bono and T Bone Burnett, and it was a thing that was designed to, frankly, to create a way for musical artists to not get ripped off by record labels. Mm-hmm. Well, a record label attorney came in after we put three years into it, and this is the reason Bono and I became business partners. After we put three years into it, this guy came and persuaded one of the key players to drop out, and everybody was so frustrated. T Bone turned to us and says, "Roger." These ideas you have are good. You need to make a band that's just there to show people a different way. And he said, new band, a new name, new music, and a new legend. So we took this notion of the legend to heart. So we have to have a moon house legend. Well, first of all, we had to have a name. Oh yeah, what does that mean, uh, a, a legend? What he meant was, you, you need to do something that's not just a band that he said, look, the way you are, this whole way you approach things is you look at it as a communal thing. I mean, listen, the first shows I went to as a kid were at Saratoga Performing Arts Center. Second show I ever saw was the first Dark Side of the Moon tour in 1973. Paid $1 to get in, right? They, the brand new, you know, it was like the surround sound thing. They had that, yeah. the first time anybody had a video mm-hmm. with the coins dropping. And, you know, I'm just sitting there, oh my God. The next week I saw the Allman Brothers, right? And it's like, you know, you're paying a buck. There's no security. It's just people being nice to each other. It was really fun. Then I went to Watkins Glen. It was like, oh my God. You know, here's 600,000 people. I'm 17 years old. And I'm, you know, having, shall I say, the time of my life. And, you know, you look at all this stuff. And, you know, what are the, the, the notion of Moon Elves was, well, wait a minute. We don't want to be like another band. The world right now really, I think, has taken the music of our youth and made it a new classical music. And so tribute bands are a huge force in the universe today. And we didn't want to be, we want to be a tribute band to the band we wish we'd been in, Mm. in college. Mm. This is the band, if we'd been together in 1973, this is what we would be doing. And the notion here was there was a certain vibe around music then. And art was a huge part of it. Crafts, t-shirts, people making stuff, bringing it to the show and either selling it or trading it to each other, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we said, how do you do that? Well, that's what the legend is. So the legend was basically about this thing was, we sat there and thought about most bands that are out there are very high testosterone, that they're behind fences, that the whole thing is like dark and then it explodes at you. And then everything disappears, right? And the music industry is all based on denying you access to the talent unless you pay some big price. 
We were sitting there going, oh, we're in this weird situation because, you know, we can run an experiment. I've been really lucky. You know, when I came out of college and didn't go into music, I made a wrong turn into this place where, by a series of ridiculous accidents, I was very successful. So here we come back to music, and I'm thinking, look, I'm in a position to catalyze something new. So I'm going to think about it like an investment, but not investing in the band, investing in this pledge, in this community. And we decided we were going to, once we came up with the name Moon Owls, and our art director, Chris Shaw, and his wife, uh, Alexander Fisher, who's also a very close to artist, were there when we came up with the name, and they were the ones who were the tiebreakers because they said, look, that name is just going to lend itself to poster art. And part of the legend was there were going to be posters in every single show, a unique poster every right. day. Before we get to that, what was the tiebreaker between? Was it Moon Alice? You know, no one can remember what the other ones. We can all remember some early rejects that were particularly tactless. It wasn't Moon Ralph, was it? No, 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 no. no. But we were thinking about things like Taterhead. I remember that being one that got rejected kind of late. And it, keep in mind, part of the problem is that you've got to be able to get the, the web address, right? And that was just ridiculous process. Well, Taterhead was taken? No, we got Taterhead. Oh, okay. And that was the problem. It wasn't that great a name, but we were able to get the URL. So it was like, whoa, hey, we got the URL. And everybody's going, yeah, what a stupid name. Mm -hmm. well, I kind of like Mr. Potato Head, so I thought Tater Head was actually a good name. Uh, another step back is when T-Bone approached you and, or just told you. Hey. T-Bone is this, one of the most creative, wonderful, entertaining, but well-informed, thoughtful, mm -hmm. uh, really insightful human beings you yep. could ever hope to meet. I mean, yeah. I know you know him, but for those who, who don't, he's he's a larger-than-life human being who excels at many things. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a producer, just unbelievable. And what he said was, we've been working, I mean, we've been basically spending a day or two a week together for two years. On Project Independence. On pro it was called Project Independence. And the project lasted three years. T-Bone came into it about, well, maybe six months in, and then was there loyally right to the end. And... Uh, and it was a good idea. It could have worked. It probably would be better than what we have now. But you know, you can't tell people what to think. So T Bone's really pissed off. I'm really cranky, and he just goes, "We're going to do this thing, and I'm going to produce the album." So we're in one studio, and Robert Plant and Alison Krauss are in the other one, both in the Village in L.A. They're doing Racing Sand. We're doing the first Moon Owls album, and we decide, "Well, Bono's got this theory," and he goes, "Look, the way people are is they attach themselves to a new technology." He says, everybody thinks it's about the music, but it's really about showing off the hardware that people are most proud of. <laughs> and his point was, was that, look, the hip hop guys got subwoofers and they nailed it. And it always, I think, bothered them a little bit that they didn't figure out subwoofers before the hip hop guys. But you know, the Beatles with LPs, Pink Floyd with stereo, the Eagles and the Allman Brothers with car stereo, right? I mean, you, you capture a gestalt like that, you ride away. And, so we're looking for things, and T-Bone's got this idea. Look, there's all these playback things. You know, little iPods and tape recorders and LPs and all sorts of stuff. And yet, the albums are just mixed for radio, and nobody listens to radio anymore. So basically, music gets turned into MP3s that sound terrible everywhere. Why don't we make albums with five mastered versions? So you have optimal ones for listening to in your car, one for the uh, vinyl, one for uh, MP3, one for iPod, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so that's what we decided to do. Wait, but don't audio file co recording companies already use a version of this? Or they produce? Well, T-Bone T -Bone innovated on this thing and got, I think, a uh -huh. trademark. And the, uh -huh. it, he actually, it came down to a process. So I think you were correct that audio file people have different versions of yeah. things. Right. What this was, was packaging them all in one thing. Yeah. So there was a CD to be played only in your car. And then the DVD had all the computer versions, including the 9624 for your DVD player. Yeah. And that one had posters and all this other cool stuff. So yeah, T-Bone's big innovation was packaging, but also the fact that he produced optimal things on yeah. not just great stereos, but the things people really have. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right. You know, because you weren't really aiming a lot of audio files. You're basically aiming somebody who's satisfied with MP3, but giving them the best possible MP3 they can have. Mm -hmm. The question I was trying to get to uh, about T-Bone's point to you was, when he said that to you, let's do an album, 
why didn't he suggest his own band or or uh, the Flying Other Brothers or an no, existing so no, band no, that he, he could so he subsidize? Did, we did all of the above. Uh -huh. So, oh. but think of it this way: part of what we were doing was a little bit I, was a little bit like just a collection of friends going on an adventure together. This was a weird time. Um, Jack Cassidy's wife had been, uh, God rest her soul, she just died, mm -hmm. but she was fighting this heroic battle against cancer. And Jack had had to be with her during time, so Yorma had done a couple albums just by himself. So Jack was actually kind of freed up. It would be cool to have a new game. And of course, Jeannie Smith had been playing with us in the latter days of the Flying Up Bros. Uh, and we had Barry Slass, of course, and Anne, and, and me, and then Jimmy Sanchez on drums. So from T-Bone's point of view, as studio musicians, that was a really good core to work with. And he was, you know, I don't know if you know this, but T-Bone has a, if you will, a sound. So when you go and do an album with T-Bone, there's a, a lot of T-Bone in it. And this one in particular, because the sound that is in Raising Sand, right? There's this tremendous uh, roots thing mm. that it almost feels like Rolling Thunder, mm -hmm. and you know, which is done with these very old drums with lambskin covers and all. And so he has this way of doing it. He was experimenting back and forth between the two. Well, it was obvious to us that those guys were going to have a Grammy Award winning album. So we decided we're not going to put our album out for a year. We'll go out and start to just tour and get to know the market without an album. Mm -hmm. That was a terrible idea. And anyway, long story short, T Bone put heart and soul and produced this work that we are all so proud of. And because of how well Racing Sand did, literally all the PR people said to me, guys, we are totally T-boned out here. You know, we just, you know, I mean, there was like the, a couple of years of T-bone right there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he'd been on a roll for quite a while. It was like we were just the, we were the bridge too far. And it was like, oh my God, you're kidding. We've just done this really great thing that we're all so proud of and nobody cares. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's real life, and it happens to every band, right? And we were explicitly built on this notion of old school, you know, that you can't, you know, 1973 was not about, you know, nobody faked it then. So by definition, you know, we were gonna have to play all the stuff, and we we're gonna have to go out and do all the stuff, and so we had to get a different plan. And so I sat down with T-Bone, and he just said, Roger, dude, you are the tech guy. Just go and do the tech. And T-Bone gave me a million pieces of good advice, and he was exactly right. I had always tried to separate the two because mm. people in music would, you know, not the musicians, who were always cool, but people who didn't hear what I played or didn't hear the bands I was in would tend to say, well, that guy must be some kind of dilettante, right? And the truth is that 12 years ago, when I started playing in San Francisco, Dawn Holiday at Slims, my greatest coach, said, Roger, you're just going to have to go out and woodshed. You're going to have to play a thousand shows before people accept you. Mm -hmm. Here we are, 1,100 mm -hmm. shows later, and, you know, it's, she's right. Yeah. You can't, in music business, you cannot cut corners. I mean, you see what happens. Poor Justin Bieber gets sick into the wastebasket, but the music, so he's still singing right through the whole thing, right? And you go, hmm, well, that is not us. And, you know, it's, when you look at what we're trying to do, you know, we're not, trying to sell records, we're trying to go out there in a brutally difficult economic time and create this little oasis where people can come together in a world where, seriously, there are no judgments, nobody's going to assume that you're a terrorist, nobody's going to assume that you're going to break the law. In fact, they're basically going to just assume you're going to follow the golden rule, and we're going to go and have a party. And at the end, we're going to trade art. We're going to bring the music, the poster artists are going to bring the posters, the fans are going to bring all the other stuff, whether it's woodworking, uh, coffee mugs, t-shirts, stuffed wombats. I mean, our fans are the most creative people on earth. And the reason is because you can bring art there and nobody sits there and goes, look, that's not as good as Stanley Mouse. Well, that isn't the point. Mm -hmm. The point is to bring beauty and to have a place where it's okay. Yeah. Not only okay, it's encouraged. Where we say, look, dude, what is the thing you can do? Well, if it's, if it's making apple pie, bring apple pie. But what I realized was it was much easier to give away the music than it was to try to sell it. 
So when we were done with T-Bone's thing, the amount we spent on it was pretty significant, but the amount we were gonna have to spend to market it was huge. And if we weren't gonna get a big tailwind, it, it just seemed like too much risk. Right. So I took the same amount of money. Basically, we let go our manager, we let go our publicist, and we let go of the label. And I took that money and instead put it into making the music free. Mm -hmm. So what's really weird is we've operated with essentially with me as the manager and you know doing our own publicity through Facebook and Twitter and without a label. And we give away the music because economically we're still better off than we would be if we were trying to sell albums. Yeah. And so the, the funny thing, Ben, is we've driven the cost of doing this so low that now we have a publicist because we, one, we can afford one, and two, it's important to let people know that you know we're not the only band on earth who can do this. And how is that word getting out about Twittercast and live stream and well, so, YouTube? So I don't know. I mean, we have 63,000 fans on Facebook right now, but the thing that's so unusual is I checked this morning and exactly half of them have either liked, forwarded, or commented on something we wrote in the last week. Hmm. Half of them. Mm -hmm. That is, I mean, in Facebook terms, that's a level of engagement to very few organizations. You can see there are people with 10 million fans who do not have 30,000 of them in the conversation mm -hmm. this week, mm -hmm. right? Because in the conversation is where the economic value is. And so we have built this really robust thing on Facebook. How do we do it? We give them a lot of great content, a lot of which is poster art and music, live shows, recordings, whatever it is. We sell CDs. We'll sell you CDs of the live shows. People buy them. Lots of people buy the posters. I'm not against making money. Yeah. But this is the way I'm giving back to all the musicians, and especially the poster artists and all, who've made me, who've enriched my life so much. It's just like, you know, I could, look, people have been successful in my line of work. Go someplace and put their name on a building. I don't have that kind of money. I sit there and go, look, I can't save the world, but I can do something good for poster art, and I can do something good for musicians. I can do something good by showing an example, creating an environment, so bands can see that a bunch of people who are not exactly young and handsome can have a brand new rock and roll band playing original music with a killer light show, killer posters, and that that scene is worth hanging. We'll never be hit. But that, thank God for that. I mean, we're old school. Mm -hmm. If your idea of a good time is what people did in 1973, you're going to love us. But if your idea of a great time is going to a rave, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> right. so. But speaking of rewards for what you've done and the way you've gone about doing it, you have the situation of being accepted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame library and archives because yeah. of the digital logs. For well, you know what they did there? 420. Yeah, why? Because the, the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, it's not a, a league, right? It's keeping track of a whole genre of music. And the problem is the most innovative new stuff that's going on in music isn't happening in labels who have historically kept track of all that stuff. But the labels aren't keeping track of bands doing their own thing. So the Rock and Roll of Fame has started to look out to see, and it's basically asking bands, if you do something that's really groundbreaking, let us know. We would like to call attention to it, popularize it. Because the way that we got to 2.3 million downloads of It's 420 somewhere is not magic. It could be done by anybody who's got a good song mm -hmm. and a real fan base. You know? I mean, that's 2.3, that's not 2.3 million listens, 2.3 million people downloaded the song onto their storage device. And, you know, I gotta be honest with you, we got a sign here for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You could have knocked or two hundred fifty thousand units. You could have knocked me over with a feather. Mm -hmm. It never occurred to me we'd do any more than that. We've done a million more than that, and it's like we went from sorry, we've done two million more than that. Two million more than that. We went from one million to two million in like I, think, I want to say three months, and we did half a million in the twenty days before four twenty this year, and it was like. You're just sitting there going, this is unbelievable. Every day it was like 60,000, 70,000 a day. And you're just going, holy moly. And then you realize, well, 420 is coming up. Yeah. So maybe they'll have a spike every year. <laughs> but, you know, you look at that and you go, how did that happen? And the answer is, I haven't any idea. And most of those people have no idea who we are. Obviously, we haven't been in touch with all 2.3.
But that wasn't the deal. The deal was if you like our music, listen to it. And a lot of people have. But has that spiked the uh, uh, visits to the website? That we have. Well, the thing about it, we integrate Facebook with the website. So yeah. the two things operate uh, more or less interchangeably. The answer is off the charts, yes. I mean, like I say, the key thing to look at is if you've got 30,000 fans interacting with you in a week, and they're all in the United States as ours are, you can play in a lot of towns, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's a highly energized fan base. And, you know, I look at this, and you can see this. I mean, you know, whether we're playing the Great American Music Hall here or the Brooklyn Bowl in New York, I mean, there are, we're playing bigger rooms much more successfully, but you know, when we do outdoor shows, they're outrageous. We, you know, this summer we played probably 25 shows in town parks. Why do we do that? Because we're in an economic depression and free music is one of the easiest things on earth to produce. And it makes people really happy. And you look around and you go, wow, that's a cool idea. So we play five shows in Union Square in San Francisco, and then every town will have us around the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And it's so cool because, you know, once you're there, they make it automatic. And a couple towns like Pacific Grove, which is down by Monterey, they, I mean, they had us, I think, four times this year. And it was like, they just couldn't get enough emails. And it's like, cool. And you go, wow, you know, it's like, I always liked that line in uh, uh, Europe 72, you know, went straight to the chop charts in Turlock, California, uh, I'm talking about trucking, and, you know, I like to think that we're big in Pacific Grove, my kind of thing. <laughs>